Unrivaled is ready to go all out for Caitlin Clark, who are exploring the lengths that they could be willing to go to to bring her in. Plus, the Timberwolves enter the season as title contenders, but who will own them by the end of the season is still under dispute. We're also speaking with the Cincinnati Bengals' Sam Hubbard. Plus, we have stories from the NFL, MLB, college basketball, and tennis. It's Thursday, October 24th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. In today's episode, my colleague Mike McCarthy details his reporting on the Unrivaled League and its planned offer to Caitlin Clark. We're also looking at the state of the Minnesota Timberwolves with Eric Fisher, which just made a big signing despite ambiguity over who is going to own the team going forward. We have stories about a 17-year-old basketball player, a 45-year-old tennis player, and a massive Monday night football fail. Later, we're speaking with the Bengals' Sam Hubbard on his experience this year, going to the Super Bowl a few years ago, and being on the field last Sunday for Deshaun Watson's season-ending injury. First, hear your top headlines. The baseball that Shohei Otani hit, making him the first 50 home run, 50 stolen base player in MLB history, just made history of its own. The ball sold at auction for $4.4 million on Tuesday, making it the most expensive ball from any sport ever sold. The previous record was set way back in 1999, when Mark McGuire's 70th home run ball sold for $3 million. An interesting wrinkle to the story, we're not really sure who will get all of that money. Ownership of the ball is under litigation, and Golden Auctions has agreed to hold the money in an account until proper ownership is legally settled. If you find yourself traveling abroad, say after making $4 million from selling a historic baseball, and you want to watch an NFL game without scrambling to find a pub, DAZN has your back. DAZN launched a service called NFL Travel Pass that allows Americans overseas to watch NFL games for $17.99 per week. NFL Travel Pass will feature access to all NFL broadcasts, including Red Zone, the playoffs, NFL Network, and NFL Originals. A decade-long antitrust lawsuit against UFC has finally come to an end. Judge Richard Bulware approved a settlement that sees the UFC paying out $375 million to plaintiffs. The lawsuit argued that UFC engaged in a scheme to acquire and maintain monopsony power in the market for elite professional MMA fighter services using exclusive contracts, coercion, and acquisitions that eliminated potential competitors. The settlement will see fighters represented take home anywhere between $50,000 to $1 million. Rudy Gobert agreed to a three-year, $110 million extension in a deal announced moments before the Timberwolves tipped off their season opener against the Lakers. Gobert's extension locks him down to the Timberwolves through the remainder of his prime and secures a much-needed big man for Minnesota after trading Carl Anthony Towns to New York. Elsewhere in the NBA, the league is planning an investigation into the Philadelphia 76ers' plan to limit Joel Embiid and Paul George on back-to-back -back games this season, which team president of basketball operations Daryl Morey revealed earlier this week. This is the second season in which players need to hit the 65-game mark to qualify for awards in all NBA teams, but it is possible that Embiid and George could miss all of the Sixers' back-to-backs this season, of which they are 15, and still qualify. As of last year, NBA rules limit how much stars like Embiid and George are permitted to rest as long as they are healthy. Speaking of having the best in the world on the court, the Women's 3-on-3 Basketball League Unrivaled is preparing a Messi-like offer for Caitlin Clark. When Messi, the face of international soccer, joined MLS last year, he received a $150 million contract, partial team ownership, and a split of the revenue from Apple's MLS season pass. Unrivaled believes Clark is worth a similar deal with their own league. Foreign Office Sports tuned in columnist Mike McCarthy broke the news, and he's joining the show to break down what this potential deal means for Unrivaled and Clark. That conversation is next. I'm joined now by Front Office Sports tuned in columnist Mike McCarthy. Welcome, Mike. Great to be here, Owen. Yeah, great to have you as always. So you're reporting that the Unrivaled League, the three-on-three -three women's basketball league starting in January, is preparing a Lionel Messi-like offer for Caitlin Clark. What does that mean? Well, Owen, when you want a genuine needle mover like Messi or like Clark, you need to get creative. You can't just offer them a good salary. They are offering that. I hear that their uh, offer is going to be in the $1 million range compared to 76000 that she makes in WNBA. But you got to be creative on top of that. And what I mean by that is you got to give her equity stakes and perhaps a profit sharing. I think one of the most fascinating things about Messi's move to Miami was how Apple and MLS gave him a share of the signups. I've never heard of anything like that of you, and I know you're a soccer guy. So that, that's what I mean uh, when, I, when I say a uh, Lionel Messi-like deal. If you want the Messi effect, you got to get creative. Yeah, and so this would involve, you know, you know, probably the biggest salary or tied for the biggest salary that they're offering. 
uh, plus, yeah, significant equity stake in the league. Is that is that the basic thrust here? I think I think that's uh, where it, it starts. I mean, the great thing about this league, and I love how they're thinking big, is they have no history. They're a startup. There's no CBA they have to follow. There's no they can do it whatever they want. So the way I'm understanding it is they're going to give everybody the highest salaries in women's professional sports leagues, but not everybody's going to get the same salary. So if you're a bigger star and the biggest star is Caitlin Clark, you're going to get the most. If you're a smaller star, you're going to get down here. If you've got a huge social media following, that means something. You'll get something here. So there's going to be a sliding scale. And I think that is a, a very creative way to do it. I mean, if you want to get somebody like Caitlin Clark, you can't pay her like the 30th player in the league. you got to pay her like she's number one. Yeah, and it, it's it's very interesting just because – you know, the WNBA, like all other professional leagues, have a salary structure where when you come in, you're going to make league minimum salaries for a few right. years. And then you can maybe get, you know, go up from there and eventually get your free agent deal. Um, whereas the Unrivaled, yeah, like you said, they are, uh, they're a startup. They're not bound by any of those rules. They can just say, you're the biggest star, you get the biggest deal. Who cares if you're 22? That's right. It's like almost like sports monopoly. They can make up the rules as they go along. Right. If you were uh, blue skying it and whiteboarding and say, here's how I'd like to structure a league. Here's how I'd like to uh, structure pay. Here's how I'd like to get the biggest star in women's sports. Maybe you know, besides uh, Billis to join my league. You got to think outside the box. You got to think about giving them ownership. You got to think about giving them re revenue sharing. You got to think about maybe a cut of merchandise sale. You got to think of all these different ways to lure that person beyond just offering a great salary. Yeah, and Clark herself is an interesting factor here just because I remember during the Olympic break, there's all this controversy of, you know, the, the U.S. team should have brought her to Paris. And she basically said, like, oh, I, I was great. I was I loved having the break. Like, you yes. know, I've been, just been playing basketball continuously. Yeah. Um, yeah, having a couple of weeks off is fine by me. Uh, obviously, the off season's a lot longer than the Olympic break. But, um, yeah, I, I have to wonder, like, does... Does she want to spend her off season having an off season or does she want to take a month to, you know, be the face of this league? It's a great question, Owen. You know, I, I think Caitlin Clark, the best thing that happened to her was not going to the Olympics. I think she needed a break. She'd been in the spotlight every day, two straight final fours. She had, a, you know, the then she had a whole league riding on her uh, skinny shoulders during her rookie season. Not to mention all the off the court drama with the, you know, the feud here and who's poked her in the eye and who knocked her down. All that. I, I think she absolutely needed a break. So I think it was smart for Unrivaled to say, you know what, let's back off. Let's not put on the heart, you know, the full court press yet. Let her, you know, uh, relax. Let her have an off season. And then when she's maybe tired of golfing and she's ready to start hooping, we come along. Now, here's the uh, the beauty of this offer, right? They're offering her a million dollars, say, uh, possibly, to play less than three months in Miami in the middle of winter. If I'm making 76 grand a year and I'm living in Wintry, Iowa, that doesn't sound like a bad uh, idea to me. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a great point. And yeah, you know, I hadn't really thought about this, but... When she came into the league, you know, there was something of a hazing process with her. Um, and, you know, I, we'll see how that progresses. I wonder if part of the negotiations are, you know, how am I going to be treated in this league? You know, what what's the officiating going to be like? What happens if people are throwing me hard fouls? Um, I don't know how important that is to her. She pretty much brushed it off as far as I could tell during the regular season. But uh, and, you know, maybe she's she's been hazed and now she can move on. And but I, I wonder, like, to what degree she's saying, you know, like, well, what am I getting into here? You know, I, that's a great point. Owen. I didn't even think to ask the people, uh, my sources about that. You know, is there going to be some sort of guarantees for her that she'll be protected? You know, kind of the Jordan rules that all superstars expect to get that little extra attention, that little extra protection from the refs and from uh, other players. I, I, I've said it all along. You know, I'm a New York Knicks fan. You know what I mean? They need an enforcer. Whatever teams they're on, you know, they need an enforcer, or Charles Barkley, somebody like that, to protect their star. That way, you know, if you go after them, you know what I mean, and you knock down Caitlin Clark, you're going to hit the hardwood yourself. That's just the way it works. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and this league hasn't even started yet, so it'll be really interesting to see, you know, how all these, these dominoes – play out here. Uh, Mike McCarthy, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thank you. 
Diego Forlan spent much of the century as one of the top soccer players in the world. He won the European Golden Shoe Award twice for being the continent's top scorer while with La Liga's Villarreal. Prior to that, he made 98 appearances for Manchester United. He also won the Golden Ball in the 2010 World Cup on Uruguay's national team and helped them win Copa America the following year. Now, at age 45, he is about to play in his first ATP tennis event. He will be in the doubles portion of the Uruguay Open in Montevideo alongside Federico Correa. It's never too late to start a second career. Over to someone 28 years his junior, much of the discussion around NIL has focused on football, which makes sense because that's where most of the money is gone, but we're starting to see big numbers in college basketball as well. Top recruit AJ Debansa is expected to land an NIL deal worth north of $3 million, according to On3. The 6'9", 17-year-old from Utah reportedly has offers from 29 schools and has visited BYU, Alabama, North Carolina, Kansas, Kansas State, Auburn, and USC. At some point, there will be some amount of governance over the deals college athletes can sign. Until then, the current ecosystem will continue to see waves of change, and we are just starting to see that in men's basketball. Over time, these same factors will come for women's basketball, college baseball, and other sports as well. Buckle in. To the NFL, we may have found the one thing that the NFL doesn't immediately turn to gold, and it's ESPN+. The Chargers-Cardinals game on the streaming service drew only 1.8 million viewers. That figure also includes the local broadcasts in LA and Phoenix, and it would be a great number for most leagues, but it is very low by the NFL standards. That said, Disney, or whoever scheduled Monday night's NFL doubleheader, did not exactly set itself up for success. The Ravens-Bucks game on ABC, ESPN, and ESPN2 started at 8.15 Eastern on Monday. The Chargers-Cardinals game on ESPN Plus started 45 minutes later. If you put an NFL game on a streaming service with limited reach, it's understood that you won't get the same numbers you'd get on a regular broadcast, but you might be able to drive up subscriber numbers. And a major part of ESPN's future is in streaming and growing ESPN Plus's subscriber count past the roughly 25 million where it is now. So it's bizarre that the ESPN Plus game was scheduled to start midway through the other game that was on that night. That meant there were more than 16 million NFL fans who have had to stop watching one game and switch from a TV broadcast to an app to watch the second one. Maybe Disney's hands were tied here by scheduling agreements we don't know about, but this is about as low as a major network can go with an NFL broadcast. The Minnesota Timberwolves are making trades and signing extensions, but it's not clear who will own the team in a month. My colleague Eric Fisher has the latest on the fates of the Wolves and their sister team, the Lynx, which just came within a single point of a WNBA championship. He joins us next. I'm joined now by Front Office Sports Newsletter writer Eric Fisher. Welcome, Eric. Hello. Uh, great to have you on. So uh, the Minnesota Timberwolves are you know, one of the top teams in the NBA, uh, made it to the conference finals last season, and it's unclear who is going to own them going forward, but we may be getting some clarity on that sometime soon, I understand. Yeah, so we've got a uh, arbitration hearing coming up on November 4th, and this could be close to, if not the end game in an ownership dispute that's been running for uh, seven months now. Um, ever since uh, late March, Glenn Taylor sort of pulled the plug on a multi-stage takeover by Alex Rodriguez and Mark Lohr. They, are, they were already and are at 40% of the Timberwolves' uh, ownership and of the Lynx, and they were set to take the controlling stake, uh, but Taylor said that they did not meet uh, some key deadlines, pulled the rest of the team off the market, and the situation has been in this dispute all this time. But again, we may finally be getting to an endpoint here, and, and we'll have some clarity on who the majority owner of these teams are going to be. Yeah, and just to back up for our listeners, um, A-Rod and Laura agreed to a deal with Taylor uh, a couple of years ago, I think, at this 2021. point. 2021. Yeah, oh, wow, it was back in 2021. And it was, But it's going to be a staged purchase where they got 20% at a time. They got those first two 20% chunks, yep. missed deadlines for that third chunk. And at that point, the Timberwolves and the Lynx, where uh, their values had gone up considerably. And Taylor, as you said, pulled the plug on the deal. Um, any movement um, from the buyer's side, the hopeful buyer's side, uh, that we've seen recently. Yeah, so uh, some things have been happening recently and, and a little further back that most recently and perhaps most dramatically uh, that these guys have put, uh, Rodriguez and Laura have put about $940 million in escrow and they're ready to make the final payment in this $1.5 billion deal. Now, as you correctly indicate, these teams are worth much more than that now, but those were the terms of the original agreement and they've put this money aside 
basically making a very clear and definitive statement. The money is here. We're ready to go. We're ready to close this thing as per the original agreement. Uh, now, to help sort of get them to that point, they've spent the summer uh, rallying up other outside investors to be part of their group, perhaps most notably former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg. And they've been sort of steadily shoring up their side of this. But this latest escrow uh, payment sort of is designed to make that statement that, hey, we've got the money, we're ready to go. Right. And of course, having the money was sort of had, not having the money was was how this whole thing kind of got set in motion. So we've got a hearing on November 4th. Is that basically Glenn Taylor will say you guys didn't abide by the terms of the deal. So the deal's off and the other side will say, yes, we did. And we have the money and we'll see what the judge says. Yeah. And so this is uh, it's sort of an interpretation of some pretty uh, minute, arcane uh, contractual language in terms of what meeting certain deadlines meet uh, represents and what those steps actually constitute. And so there's going to be some interpretation therein. Uh, but yeah, they're going to sort of look at the uh, uh you know, all the innards of that contract and come to some sort of conclusion. The Timberwolves, of course, are still operating as a basketball team. They, you know, they traded Carl Anthony Towns, the Knicks. They just signed Rudy Gobert to a $110 million extension. Um, is this still, you know, the Taylor regime is acting like this is their team until further notice? Yes. And, and you, you know, regardless of where anybody may sit in in terms of their sentiments on this dispute uh full marks to them in terms of trying to sort of put their best foot forward still now there was some cap implications in terms of that towns deal uh but they you know with what they've got left you know and you reference the gobert extension they're tr still trying to make uh the foremost go of it uh but it's going to be interesting because we don't know who actually is going to be paying uh, that Gobert extension that kicks in next year, you know, runs into 2028. Uh, so, again, they've made a statement that, you know, this four-time defensive player of the year, he's a cornerstone, needs to be here. You know, what we're all waiting to <laughs> see, of course, is who actually pays the bill. Very interesting stuff. Eric Fisher, thanks for joining us on the show. Always a pleasure. Sam Hubbard has played in a Super Bowl and suffered through some lean years in his time with the Cincinnati Bengals. I spoke with him about his experience of all that and the changes he's seen in the NFL over his career. That conversation's next. I'm joined now by Cincinnati Bengals defensive end Sam Hubbard. Welcome, Sam. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, great to have you on. Um, so, you know, the season's had some ups and downs for you, but you know, you got to win on Sunday. What's the vibe been like in the Bengals locker room? Yeah, we got off to a, a bit of a rough start. We faced a lot of adversity, um, got humbled a little bit and stuck together as a team. And we've won some good games these last three or four and got a lot of football ahead of us. And, uh, you know, we're optimistic about the future. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, in your last game against the Browns, I'm assuming you were on the field when Deshaun Watson went down with, you know, what ended up being a season engine, season ending injury. Um, was that a moment where you knew right away that there was something pretty serious or is it just kind of hard to tell in the, in the action? Yeah, I was on the field. It was, uh, you know, design run play, I think, where, you know, he went down and I was being blocked and saw the ball and dove on the ball. But then, you you know, after the play, he's still down and it, it looked really serious. Uh, it looked like he was in some pain. So uh, hopefully he, you know, shakes back and has a, good recovery but yeah anytime someone goes down like that on the field it's tough yeah and does it change the the mood on the field to you know when all of a sudden like i guess you don't know it's season ending right then but you, you can tell that you know thing things aren't good um you know next play are you just kind of back in it or is it like you, you still feel that moment yeah it's i mean it's tough that's the sport we play what we signed up for and uh you know you you don't know what happens in the moment. You kind of just got to keep doing your job. Uh, but yeah, the, it's football. It's, you know, it's a tough, tough sport. Um, injuries happen. Yeah. Yeah, they do. Um, and you're working with Campbell's to, to fight hunger. Why don't you tell me about what you're doing there? Yeah, I'm here with Campbell's at the free store food bank. This is my third year with them. Um, they're part of their Campbell's uh, chunky sacks hunger campaign where every sack that uh, we get, they donate a thousand meals to Feeding America. So 
I have two so far this year. That's 2,000 meals. As a defense, we have 12. So, uh, you know, we're hoping for a lot, whole lot more as the season goes on. And uh, it's a great initiative. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Um, and, and, yeah, speaking of, like, the, the season going on, you guys were in the Super Bowl, you know, just three seasons ago. How did that change uh, how you saw the game in the league? Yeah, that was an unbelievable, you know, run we had in 2021 went from you know not having too much success my first three years with the Bengals to going to the Super Bowl and you know breaking the curse of no playoff wins in 31 years and it just showed me you know where we can get you know we got to the to the biggest stage and it's never easy but you know now we have full belief that it's possible and when we get there we want to finish the job but that's the ultimate goal is winning the Super Bowl. That's why I wake up to play this game. That's that's what I want to accomplish with my career. Do you have any memories from that where it was sort of like a you know the the feeling of just this is different. You know this is this is not an ordinary football game. Um, you know, and there's a rock concert in the middle of it. Um, did, did you have any moments where were you that really crystallized? Oh, yeah, so many. I mean, you get out there, it was in L.A. a week before the game, and you're doing all types of the most media you've ever done in your life. Uh, there's so much conversation and eyeballs. Uh, you're out there for the pregame warm-ups, and around the field is every celebrity you could ever think of. And uh, it's definitely a different stage, different stage, different type of attention. And the big thing is just monitoring your emotions and keeping yourself calm to do what you always do is play a football game without letting that get in the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like a mental challenge as much as anything. Yeah. Um, thinking kind of zooming out on your, your NFL career, what do you think is the biggest change you've seen in the league since you started playing? Hmm. Tough question. Um, you know, uh, a lot has changed. This is my seventh year. Um, there's been some definite rule changes, uh, as far as, you know, player safety, uh, guardian caps. I, I went through the COVID year with no fans, um, you know, media policies, the, the international games are really cool. I played in London. I uh, would love to go to one of these new locations, new countries, but yeah, it's an ever evolving game. Um, they're always staying cutting edge of everything. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, a couple of follow ups there. What's the country you'd like to play in? Uh, I think that Germany would be cool. Um, never been to, to I went to London. That's my first time ever going to Europe. So I think that'd be a really cool experience. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, on the Guardian caps, um, you know, what do you think about, you know, players steadily adopting those? Yeah, I think that anything you can do to protect the player and keep us healthy and safe is a good, good initiative. And, uh, you know, there's definitely been some things that have helped players stay healthier and on the field. And, uh, I, I think it's all positive. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I'm hoping people just steadily get used to those and it just becomes not a big deal and they become more and more ubiquitous because, um, I saw the NFL put out its concussion data from the preseason, something like 44 concussions in the preseason, which is a lot less than it was before, but, it's still 44 concussions. It's still, and that's just preseason. So still a lot. And um, about the, the new rules, um, how do you feel about, you know, like the new kickoff and the, you know, the ban on the hip drop tackle? Do um, you think those are <clears throat> positive steps or still getting used to them? Or what, what do you think? Yeah, well, we started off the game on Sunday with a, a kickoff or a touchdown that really gave a spark to our team. So uh, right now I'm, I'm a big fan of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and as, a, as a defensive player, is it, you know, just more of a challenge? I mean, I'm sure there's, you've you got to do more on those kickoffs. Yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of these rules are to protect uh, you know, offensive players. It makes it a little bit harder to to play as a defensive player. But like everything, we're, we're great athletes. We can control our body and adapt. Um, and that's what you got to do. Yeah. And on the hip drop tackle ban, um, is that something where you've had to think about how you tackle in the, the season? Um, you know, I think that that's, a, a, a you know, a move that does result in a lot of injuries and, uh, there's certain ways to tackle and that one is, you know, tough situation sometimes, but instead of, you know, doing the hip drop, you can just wrap and roll and, you know, 
something that you know they don't have an, yeah it's yeah a, something to keep players healthy yeah and was it unambiguous for you in terms of like what you can and can't do or are there moves where it's like well this is like halfway to a hip drop or something or it's like maybe i'll get a call maybe i won't if i do that do you have to kind of make those split second decisions uh, I think it's just a technique we've got, you know, it addressed in the team meeting and you work drills to properly tackle and just put yourself in the right position so it doesn't come up where uh, you, you have to rely on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, Hassan Reddick uh, finally has a contract. Um, and, you know, anytime there's these holdout situations, I feel like it's because there's a, a mismatch between what the team thinks your value is and what you think your value is. Do you think that we're in a moment of recalibration around um, the the value of top end defensive players? Um, no, I think that that stuff is part of the game, is part of the business. It happens every year, and uh, you know when I see a player in that situation, I, I always want to uh, the best for the player and to get what they deserve. And you know I'm glad they worked something out. He's a great player. It's good to have him back out there. Yeah. Um, and just for fun, who'd you say is the hardest QB to sack? Yeah, that's, you know, we've got a lot of mobile QBs coming into the game this day, these days. I got to go with Lamar Jackson. He's just different. You know, he moves unlike anybody else, two-time MVP in the league. Uh, he is tough, tough one to get on the ground. Yeah, yeah. And he'll still, like, throw a 40-yard pass, like, you know, as you're, like, running him into the corner. Uh, exactly so yeah um and before i let you go just what are you most excited about for the balance of the season yeah uh i think we got some big time prime time games i know we play baltimore and cleveland on thursday night coming up um those are some you know prime time games are always another level of intensity and fun uh but yeah just taking it week by week i love playing in front of the home crowd we got the the white white out the white bangle this sunday that's always electric. So uh, a lot to look forward to uh, as the season goes on. Yeah. Sam Hubbard, appreciate you taking the time. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. All right. Thanks for having me. To women's basketball, the last WNBA team to make the playoffs this past season was the Atlanta Dream, and the four teams that missed the playoffs were the Washington Mystics, Chicago Sky, Dallas Wings, and LA Sparks. And now none of them have a head coach. The Mystics became the latest team to declare a new direction when they announced on Wednesday that they are parting with head coach Eric Tebow and his father, general manager Mike Tebow. The Wings also need a new GM. That makes five out of 12 teams that have fired their head coach since the season ended. Sometimes random events happen in clusters, but this feels like it's part of the same story we've been telling about the league growth. Every team wants to be center stage as more and more people are tuning in and standards are rising. This league is becoming one where it's win or go home. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, tell a friend or say hi on social media. If you're on YouTube, throw us a like and subscribe. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.